Welcome to Breakthrough Success. I'm your host, Mark Aberti, the content marketing expert, bringing you five new episodes every week where I and top level guests teach you how to take your business to the next level and achieve your breakthrough. Hello, Breakthrough Success listeners. I just wanted you all to know before the episode actually starts, I've been working a little bit behind the scenes to give you something really special. So a while ago, I wrote my book, Content Marketing Secrets, which helps people create, promote, and optimize their content for growth and revenue. And I just put the finishing touches together to offer that for free to anyone who is interested. So if you want your free copy of Content Marketing Secrets, all you have to do is head over to markgaberti.com slash book. Now, let's jump right into the episode. One of the things that we really like to do as content creators is create as much content as possible. And while it comes in the form of blog posts and videos, it also comes in the form of products like training courses, services, and books. But we can't just keep creating products and expect customers to go to them. And one of the ways that we get sales for our products and build these standout type of brands is to understand our customers lingo. So that's what we were going to focus on in this episode. So who do we have today as our guest? Well, he's a business coach, speaker, and author. He's a visionary and strategic thinker who encourages others to follow a quest that is bigger than they can imagine. And following that quest with a focus also on measurable action steps so that the quest can become a reality. His latest book, Lingo teaches readers how they can discover their ideal customers' secret language and make their businesses irresistible. Today's guest for episode 228 of the Breakthrough Success Podcast is none other than Jeffrey Shaw. Jeffrey, it is such a pleasure to have you on the show. And Mark, I'm thrilled to be here with you. Thank you. Jeff, I'm really looking forward to this interview, but before we dive in, just for some background, uh, Jeffrey was the very first person to ever be on the show. He is episode one, so uh, like there is a big difference between how I was during episode one versus how I am now, so anyone who wants to see that episode, that will be in the show notes, but uh, now I'd like to get some backstory uh, a little bit more on you and your journey for um, making it easier for us to uh, understand our customers' lingo, being able to communicate with them. So can you just give us some background as to why you decided to write the book Lingo and just a few things about it? Sure. Well, you know, Mark, as you know, or you certainly, you, you know already, and yet you're you're so young, but uh, you with so much experience that you have, and what you'll continue to learn is that being in business is a series of breakthroughs, right? It's just one after another, um, you know, breakthrough moments and breakthrough transitions in our business. Uh, so Lingo is actually based on a breakthrough moment for myself 30 years ago. And what I like to say is that it's an old story, but it's more relevant today than ever. It just took me 30 years to see the value in it, honestly. Uh, and it was kind of pulled out of me by my editor in a conversation with who became my editor. She wasn't my editor at the time. But when I really got down to the nitty gritty of talking to her about how I built a successful photography business 33 years ago, um, when I shared with her what I did, she's like, now that's, that's the book you need to write. So it, it is predicated on a breakthrough, a single breakthrough moment that became then a series of small breakthrough moments that leads to one big breakthrough. So let me see if I can break this down. So 20 years old, I go off to photography school and I come back to my hometown in upstate New York or what we consider upstate New York, about two hours north of New York City. And I try to start a family portrait photography business, uh, which I consider to be upscale, meaning I was going to charge a maximum amount of money because I, I put a very high value on what it means to have photographs of your family and to hand them down. So I go back to this little hometown and struggle for three years to get anybody to buy what I was saying. And, and in fact, nobody was buying it. And like a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, I got my hustle on. Right. Almost to a detriment because I started doing photographing dance contests at uh, for radio shows, uh, you know, basically getting anybody in front of my cameras I could. 
and realizing, man, this is a terrible business model. because I'm running around chasing, tracing my tail. I'm not getting anywhere and I'm not doing the work I want. What I wanted to do is photograph families on location and children and do beautiful, large scale portraits and wasn't getting many opportunities to do that. Could not understanding why. And then a woman comes in and this Mark was one of the key breakthrough moments. A woman comes in to talk to me about my photography. I made my best pitch possible. She looks at me and she said, well, that sounds great and all, but I don't know how I'm paying for my rent this month. I don't have the luxury of worrying about my children's memories, meaning the photographs that she would buy. And that was an absolute breakthrough for me because it told me, one, I had never considered what I did a luxury product. I thought everybody should have photographs. But no, it's, it is a luxury product. If you can't afford, if your choice is between food and photographs, you're not going to choose photographs, right? So, and I realized I was literally speaking the wrong language because I'm trying to promote the lingo of the importance of long-term thinking to a community he's only worried about today. And that was a huge breakthrough for me. Uh, one, that I was speaking the wrong lingo. And two, I needed to, I was a luxury product and I therefore needed to serve a luxury market. That put me on a quest for three months to figure out the lingo of the affluent luxury market. And, and I did. I spent three months, completely rebranded my business, moved it from New York to Connecticut, uh, still doing what I most wanted to do, which was to photograph families and children on location and do beautiful, fine art photography. Uh, but in this community, in, a more, uh, in an area that could afford luxury, I was speaking their lingo. Right. I was speaking the lingo of planning ahead and preserving moments and uh, and high quality and all those things. Everything I said made sense to them where it had made it made no sense to where I came from. Getting that was the biggest breakthrough of my life, because in one year, my business multiplied five times and put me on a trajectory for the next 33 years of business. So. You know, it's one breakthrough, one little breakthrough after another can lead to a major life through breakthrough as far as I'm concerned. And I really like the idea of like um, when you hit your breakthrough, there's just more breakthroughs uh, coming along the way. So you can always like set like bigger goals for yourself. But it's really interesting how you mentioned that one uh, uh, occurrence where you met the person who said, like, I'm just trying to afford my rent. That changed your uh marketing complete that changed who you reached out to and you were speaking uh you were speaking a language where like it was a luxury brand a luxury type of service but you were speaking to the wrong crowd so like i think that story alone just captures how powerful it is to speak the same language as our customers and uh like some of us are speaking like a language for a certain customer but in your case in the beginning reaching out to the wrong type of customer so how can we learn to like we have the language that we're speaking, we have the lingo, how can we find the right people to speak it to so that they receive the message? Yeah, it is honestly, Mark, it's the biggest gap in business. You know, serving entrepreneurs um, as a coach and consultant is one of the biggest gaps I see. People come to me and, you know, if they even understand who their ideal customer is, and quite honestly, it's usually step number one, is getting clarity on defining who your ideal customer is. So that's step number one, which a lot of people think they know, but they don't really know. And, and then they put all these assumptions. Well, I know who my ideal customer is. I've done a buyer persona. I've done an avatar. And they've laid all these assumptions on them, right? But they haven't done what I think is the real work, which is to walk several miles in their shoes, right? I, I, I was a lower middle class kid. What did I know about the affluent people? But what I did have was a willingness to understand the world from their perspective, to walk in their shoes, to go to the brands where they shopped, to read the magazines that they were reading, to go to the blogs that were comfortable for them. I did all that work so that I could understand what does the world look like? What? And it all comes down to what I call emotional triggers, Mark. What are the emotional triggers that you need to trip you know, for your ideal customer, whomever they may be, that's how you speak their lingo because it's, and this is, I think the fun part about lingo is that it's actually quite unspoken, right? Because you're, by you communicating in a way that's, that's meaningful to your ideal customer, you're emotionally, uh, kind of tricking, trip, tripping their emotions and getting them to respond. So step number one is you have to get clear on who your ideal customer is. That's imperative so that you're then building your business 
and building your brand messaging, the brand image, and every, your services, everything, content creation, you're then building everything with a clear, empathetic understanding of your ideal customer, which makes them feel like, wow, this business, this brand really gets me and is speaking my lingo. And in the book, I teach a, a five-step strategy, if you will, which, you know, it, it, when you're ready to, we, we can go into that as well. And um, I'm wondering if we could just go right into that uh, five-step sure. strategy, because like, I know it's in the book, but just if you could provide a, a brief overview of it for us. Yeah. Let me just give you a brief overview, because it, it, yeah, I want everybody to kind of walk away with action steps that they can take, um, or at least an understanding that the, I guess that what's most important is they walk away feeling like there's an understanding that the steps they can take will make sense, because I feel like a lot of what I have to offer is contradictory to what a lot of people have heard. And, and here's why I think it is. I'm not formally educated in marketing and branding. What I teach is real entrepreneurial experience, right? Because I've been an entrepreneur for 33 years. So I do speak the lingo of your, your audience, right? And that's the key, right? I'm not coming at to you with you know, a list of degrees. And uh, no, this is real entrepreneur experience, but how you can build a business where your goal is to only work with your ideal, most profitable customers and create the content that, that resonates for them. So uh, the five steps of the secret language strategy is step number one, I already touched on it, is perspective. You have to understand the perspective of the people you're building a business and writing content for. Right. And it, this is so backwards from the way most people build a business. So the first thing they do when they go into business is they launch a website and they fill it up with a bunch of words and information that isn't actually speaking to the right audience. And then they wonder why they're getting the wrong customers. Right. So step number one is perspective. You have to do your homework to understand not the demographic, not the statistics, not the buyer persona, not the avatar. Do you understand the emotions, the lifestyle, the values and priorities? of the people you want to build a business for. Okay, so that's step number one. Step number two, one of the strongest emotional human triggers that we have is familiarity. We as, as humans are strongly drawn to what feels familiar to us. Doesn't mean it's a copy, doesn't mean it's exactly like anything else, but it has a comfort to it because familiarity lets us know we're in the right place, right? And this is very important when it comes to, to marketing because you know, if you're someone who's comfortable in Home Depot, that's your place. If you're someone who's comfortable in a high end shopping environment, that's your place. Right. But, you know, we're often not comfortable in both places. Right. If you actually watch the the shopping patterns of, of one example I, I use in the book and when I work directly with coaching clients is grocery stores. Right. There are some people that are comfortable in Whole Foods and some that are comfortable in Costco. You won't find too many people that are comfortable in both atmospheres. Right. So familiarity is really important. So if you, the more you understand the perspective, because it's a de familiarity is a deeply emotional experience. So when you understand the perspective of your ideal customer, you then can create services, policies, the look, the feel of your online assets, your content, whether it's, you know, humorous, whether it's formal, you can create everything for your business in a way that it feels familiar based on the, the patterns and lifestyle and values of your ideal customer. Okay. So we have perspective with familiarity. Next is style. Really important today because style is the quick decision maker. We make decisions. We as consumers make decisions every day, practically instantly on whether we feel like the style of something resonates for us, right? So in a world of very short attention span, your content, your website, your emails, everything that we're putting out in the way of content, our potential customers are evaluating, judging whether to open that email, whether to stay on your website in nine seconds or less. Right. So what and based on what do they make that decision? It's an immediate feeling as to whether the style of this website suits me. Right. If the uh, the the subject line of the email resonates for me, is it in my style? So, for example, if you're trying to reach an audience that, uh, you know, is conservative or formal, well, then, you know, 
catchy headlines with, you know, asterisks replacing curse words. And it probably isn't going to feel like their style. You know, a comparison, uh, 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 a metaphor I offer in the book is if you ever shop, Mark, at like a TJ Maxx where there's a variety of designers in one sized section. So let's say you're you know, looking in the smalls. You flip through those hangers looking for a shirt. And what makes you stop? Right. What makes you stop is, wow, that feels like it's my style. That's a style of shirt I would wear. Style is a quick decision maker and really important in a world of short, such short attention span that your ideal customer feel like you are presenting your business and your brand in a style that already suits them. All right. So next is pricing psychology. Hardly anything is more powerful. And I find a lot of entrepreneurs want to stay away from pricing, right? They, they shy away from it. And yet it's the most powerful tool you have to position your business exactly in where in the market it belongs to reach your ideal customers because pricing creates perception and is in your power to decide how do you want your business to be perceived? Do you want your business to be perceived as cost conscious? Do you want your business to be perceived as high end? Do you want your business to be perceived as easily accessible or exclusive? It's your choice. But what we do know, Mark, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, we make, we make judgments all the time whether to do a business with a business or a brand based on the price point and even how the prices look right there's a certain you know obviously you get a certain perception of a restaurant if there's no prices on the menu and you get a different perception at mcdonald's when it's a dollar meal this is one of the biggest breaks i cannot tell you mark how many entrepreneurs come to me frustrated that they're not working with their ideal customers the, the most profitable customers they um, tend to be higher end or they're, you know, they're complaining, their customers are trying to uh, talk them down and ask for discounts. And I'll look at their pricing structure and all those online courses they've created are all 197, 497, 997, right? Because this is what we see in online marketing all the time. But let me ask you this. If you're going to draw attention to the fact that $3 matters, that 497 is more clever than 500, then how can you complain about people trying to nickel and dime you? Right? This is one of the biggest lessons I learned when I started studying the difference between a high end and a low end market. Walmart, that's the way Walmart prices their products. And that's why Walmart attracts a cost conscious customer. You go into a high end store, the prices are all round off, round off. It's not 497, it's $500. Right. So, again, it's actually in the business owners, the founders control to decide how they want their business to be perceived and then price accordingly aligned with the psychology of your ideal customer. And then the last of the five steps is words. It's only at the last stage. Can you then speak their lingo? Too many businesses come out of the gate, go into business. They think they know everything about their ideal customer. They put everything out there and then they wonder why their business isn't working. It's because they didn't do the four steps first. It's not until you understand your ideal customer's perspective, what triggers the emotion of familiarity, what causes them to make quick decisions based on style and that you've positioned your business aligned with their pricing priorities. It's only then can you speak their lingo and, and use the right, you know, craft the right words, the right emails, the right content, the right blog posts. It's only then can you do that as a final stage to speak the lingo of your ideal customers. I hope that was helpful, Mark. Jeffrey, thank you for providing us that five uh, step framework. And there's a lot in there, uh, a lot that your business can do to, uh, further communicate in the same lingo as your customers. But one of the things that I want to ask you, and this comes from a book that I read a while back called Brick by Brick. Basically, one of the things in that book is that Lego like almost went out of business because they they had the lingo down, but then they decided to expand and create more uh, different kinds of products. And the way they expanded, they lost the lingo that they had with their customers. So. My question to you is how can we continue to expand, pursue new projects, new products, things like that, uh, without losing the current uh, relationship we have with our existing core customers? Mm -hmm. 
It's a great question. Um, first of all, and I do talk about expansion uh, in lingo uh, from the perspective of what has been referred to as find a niche. Right. Uh, I'm more along the philosophy of ditching the niche. Right. Or at least redefining it. And what I, the way I redefine the idea of a niche, I, I just think having a narrow niche nowadays is a, a dangerous business model. Um, I think there's a different way. Right. So because a niche traditionally has meant find one thing to do to one audience of people. The, what I think you can do is if your your niche should be your lingo, your niche should be your area of expertise. Right. Your niche should be the ideal customer whose lingo you're speaking. But here's the key, and here's where it's expansive. When you are known for a certain area of expertise, you mentioned Lego, right? If they would have to get clear on their area of expertise, which I would say is around the area of fun, right? Um, that's kind of their area of expertise. It doesn't mean the only thing that they can do is, is build toys for children, right? That's why they expand them to an amusement park and you know, and, and if I were to dig in deeper and, and work with our management team, I'll bet there's more to, I mean, fun in itself is too broad because there are hundreds of thousands and millions of businesses whose area of expertise might be fun. But what is Lego fun, right? It's one of the things I talk about in the book is what is the unique perspective of your business or brand uh, that you bring to the table that's different, right? So I'd want to know what is the unique, not value proposition, but perspective. What is the unique perspective about fun that that is probably in the story as to why Lego was created in the first place? When you become clear on that, you then are able to imagine multiple audiences and multiple things that you can do with your area of expertise without losing that core lingo. Right. But realizing also, you know, if you're, I guess an example would be baby boomers, right? A lot of us, I'm, I'm actually the last year of the baby boomer generation. 1964 is my year of birth, and that's the last year considered of the baby boomers. But nonetheless, I grew up on Lego, Ling, uh, Legos, right? The lingo event, you, you sometimes have to morph your lingo because those baby boomers are now grandparents, right? So who's making the decision if the grandparents are the, the initiators of, of bringing their grandchildren, if that turns out to be a primary market for Lego as a company, for grandparents to inspire the purchase of Legos and to bring them to a Lego amusement park, et cetera, um, then it's a different lingo, right? A little bit of a nostalgia, but yet kids still love lingo, Legos. And you'd have to figure out what, you know, so lingos can can morph and change as the market does as well. But it's being clear that you're speaking the right lingo to the right audience that matters. Jeffrey, I really like that take on um, morphing your lingo because I as uh, like different things change, like culture and things like that. And uh, as you mentioned, like a gener uh, generation class, like they get older, like the lingo does change and just to like further talk about lego and then we'll uh jump ship and go somewhere else but uh like lego is now going into like board games that you create on your own with lego pieces and they have moved like the lego movie as well so uh they are thinking of more ways to spread what jeffrey pointed out as lego's version of fun versus uh another brand's version of fun so it is very interesting to see how they have this uh core uh, message this um, core niche that they are in and just spreading that message and uh, one of the things that I also want to ask you in this uh, episode is uh, like one of the things that we all want to build is a community around our brand so I'm wondering if you could talk about how it can build a sense of community uh, around our message and around what we're doing mm -hmm. so I actually encourage entrepreneurs and businesses to look at their business as building a community instead of a business, right? Because if you are, if you're building a business, which the ultimate goal, by the way, of, of lingo as a concept and as a book, uh, the, the ultimate goal I want for entrepreneurs is for them to work almost entirely with their ideal customers. And I refer to this in the book as busting up the Pareto principle. The Pareto principle is the 80, 20 rule which states that 80% of your business comes from 20% of your customers. It's mathematically true in many, many different areas of life and business, but it's a bad philosophy in business because what it's really saying is that eight out of 10 customers are a waste of your time. And in today's world, 
talked about things morphing and changing. You know, we don't have it, it's just that much. Hard, it's so much noisier. There's so, there's so many more choices. We're no longer even compared to apples to apples. So there's just it's so difficult to get noticed and to stand out that I don't know any business that can afford to waste their time on an eight to 10, eight to 10 customers. We need all of them to matter. So the goal of Lingo is to build a business where you are attracting, you know, your ideal customers all the time. So it is a community, right? So if you look at, you are going to only serve your ideal customer, then you in fact are building a community and treat them as such. So for example, if you look at uh, something I did, a, a strategic move I made in my business recently, small move, but it's made a big impact, was with regards to my email marketing. I typically, or in the past, I did not include my friends on my email list because you know my friends aren't gonna become buyers. Um, you know, your friends are the first ones to make fun of you about things you put in your email. You know, it's just, it's a different, it's a different lingo, right? You talk to your friends differently. So I, my friends might, somewhere along the way have opted into my CRM, but I tagged them in a way that they wouldn't get my emails. But then I realized uh, several months ago, I had a kind of a, an aha moment of realizing that if I'm building my business in the principles of a community, then I should include my friends because everybody in my business should be thought of as a friend and part of the community. And by having my friends on my list, it has raised my level of consciousness about how often I email and what I say. Because if it's not gonna pass the friend test, then it doesn't pass the test of, you know, everybody else I'm emailing either. So for example, frequency, right? A lot of us worry about, are we emailing too frequently? Well, if you're emailing so frequently that you're annoying your friends, then you're annoying your community, your customers. But on the same hand, if you're not emailing often enough, like a friend, a friend might say, hey, am I no longer on the A-list? Have I been bumped? And that's exactly what your customers would feel like, right? So I have found actually having my friends on my email list recently puts my mindset more into that I'm building a business. And I think actually, I think speaking the lingo of your ideal customers is one of your best strategies for building a community because that's exactly what lingos are. I mean, teenagers have a lingo, right? Uh, teenagers have a lingo so that their parents don't always understand everything they're saying. Uh, texting has a lingo, right? Some shortcuts, right? Not everybody always understands. There's always slang. Slang is a lingo. And communities of people, whether they're teenagers or cultures, have always created a slang, a lingo, that kind of becomes the, the in language of that community. So lingo in itself is a tremendous community builder. I really like the idea of adding friends to your email list because it does, I mean, as you mentioned, make you a lot more conscious of how many emails you're sending, what kind of emails you're sending, and uh, in that whole bigger picture of viewing everyone who joins uh, your community as a friend versus as another subscriber on your list, another follower, or something like that. So I really like that. Um, and, and I'll add to that, Mark, your friends, I'll add to that just as far as yeah, content creation. It. Same thing with blog posts, too. The value of having your friends reading this, because if it doesn't sound like you to them, then you're being someone else in your business, right? And a lot of us battle that, you know, we have a certain, whether it's a professional facade or, you know, I know for like when I, one of my biggest challenges in writing the book lingo is I tend to write very grandiose. Like I sound like some pompous jerk in the way I write, right? But that's not how I show up on my podcast. So the, one of the most important things for me and, and communicated like, that I communicated to my editor all the time was that I want the book to feel like the, the, like who people know me to be on my podcast. And that's been the ultimate compliment. People emailing me and or messaging me and saying, gosh, reading your book is exactly like listening to you on your podcast. Similar cadence, similar warped sense of humor, right? That's the value. If your friends don't feel like you know, in reading your emails and in reading your content, if your friends don't think it sounds like you, then you're not being your authentic self to your community. Jeffrey, thank you for that add on. And um, I really like that idea of just like having the same sound, having the same uh, personality throughout all of your content, which is not as easy as it sounds actually, because you could write one way and do podcasts the other way. So if you're able to merge that together, uh, that's something that 
is really powerful. Definitely one of those like underrated things to do for your content brand. And one of the things I want to ask, like so far I've been talking about like ways to uh, build up the lingo, ways to get people to uh, like who um, hear the lingo, who are um, customers. But uh, on the other side, there are some businesses, some uh, people building communities that they don't have the lingo down. And I'm wondering, what do you believe holds most people back from uh, having that lingo and the customers who are listening very actively to that lingo? Uh, you know, Mark, another great question. It's and I'm glad to to encourage people to look at it. Like, what holds people back? First of all, I, I just lingo in itself, I think, is a pretty groundbreaking concept, right? Or I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have written a book about it. I mean, and part of it, the reason I wrote the book is it comes from, you know, as often things do, it comes from my own frustration. And my frustration um, has been that I think, uh, you know, a lot of us in business, I'd say most people in business today are really innovative and creative. We we live in a time where there's been, um, you know, I just think we have more unique businesses and the opportunity to create unusual businesses unlike any other time, right? So the problem is, is the world around us is still pretty conventional in its business practices. So a lot of us are, as entrepreneurs, we find ourselves feeling kind of lost because the world does business this way, but it doesn't really make sense for us. And we try these things. And then, of course, there's just the recirculation of advice all the time. And it, I don't know, I, I just find the world of business just keeps regurgitating the same old advice over and over and over again. And I just, my frustration comes from feeling like, but it's not speaking to me, right? I, I'm what I refer to as an uncommon entrepreneur, right? What I do, what I do as a photographer, this is what I did the people I serve. This is not what other photographers did. So, you know, volume discounts and so many of the other cheesy things that photographers do didn't work for me. Right. And I think there's a lot of us in that. So one is I just think just getting the idea of what we're talking about here, that speaking the lingo of your ideal customers is really understanding your ideal customers values, like their life values, their priorities, Right? Are they cost conscious or are they time conscious? Right. Uh, one of the examples I offer in the book is IKEA, which I love as a brand because of uh, because it's so clear. Right. Lingo. Uh, excuse me. IKEA is not speaking the lingo of of time saving. Right. It's such a long, drawn out process. You can spend the entire afternoon at IKEA. So if you're someone that is time conscious, lingo is, as uh, IKEA is not the brand for you. Right. But if you're someone that loves the satisfaction of building things yourself and doing it yourself, then Ikea is awesome for you. They're speaking your lingo. Right? I'm a very time conscious guy. I am drawn to businesses and in fact will pay a premium price for somebody to get things done for me in a shorter period of time. Right. So, you know, I think what holds a lot of people back is just, first and foremost, just not understanding that there's a different way of being in business and they just keep following the same regurgitated advice and doing things the same old way. And that's becoming harder and harder today because, you know, I work primarily with service based businesses. And one of the biggest struggle I see with service based businesses is that they feel like they're being turned into a commodity by a public who thinks that every photographer is the same. Every account is the same. Every plumber, uh, whatever service-based business you're in, we're being grouped together as, and in, in a way it's our own darn fault, right? The way we stand out now is by understanding our clients more deeply than everybody else in our competitive field so that we can stand out and draw forward our ideal customer. Jeffrey, thank you for sharing with us those insights. And um, it's really interesting how um, you mentioned that a lot of it does come down to us not understanding the customer and how we have a bunch of different preferences and being able to determine those preferences. Like, are you time conscious? Uh, can you are you a little more relaxed with your time and things like that? I mean, that's just one example. Uh, like all that matters when we're um, getting an idea of who we are creating the lingo for. So. Uh, thank you for those insights. And uh, one of the questions that I also want to tackle is 
I wonder if you could share with us one big challenge you faced while crafting your lingo, while figuring uh, all of it out, how you're going to communicate with the people in your community and a powerful lesson you learned during that challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, and I think for most of us, the biggest challenge for me was I didn't currently walk the same path as the people I was meant to serve, right? So again, I, as I said earlier, I was a lower middle class kid, but I realized that I had an I had the attitudes, the mindset, and uh, what I had to offer as a service was better fit for, for an affluent clientele. The problem was I knew nothing about affluence, right? I didn't at the time. I think the biggest challenge for any of us, and I think this is particularly in a service-based business, we are almost always serving people that are not exactly like us. So for example, if you're in a service-based business, there's a really good chance that people, your ideal customer is better off financially than you are, right? In order for them to afford your services. And then you in turn hire people who you can afford to hire. That's just kind of the way it goes. So we're almost always serving a clientele that is not walking the exact same path for life as we are. So what happens is, is we can wind up projecting what we think is important to our ideal customer, but it's actually not. We're speaking the wrong lingo because we're speaking from our perspective and not theirs. And I think this is fundamentally a really, it was my biggest challenge for sure, because I'm like, well, how the hell do I learn how to think and act and, and emotionally trigger affluent people? It wasn't my world, but you can learn it. Right. Same thing with a lot of we were talking about lingos morphing before. Think about how many businesses that have been existing for years and they're a primary buyer now are millennials. Well, guess what? Millennials have a very different set of values than the baby boomers that business has been serving. So if you don't know the lingo of millennials, then you need to stretch. It's your work to get them. This is what a lot of business. It's not their work to get you. And a lot of businesses spend way too much time trying to, trying to convince people. If you want their business, it's your job to understand them, not the other way around. Not for, it's not their job as the customer to get you and be convinced by you. It's your job to understand their life values and priorities and speak their lingo if you want their business. So that, that was my biggest challenge then. Uh, it'll always, I think it should always be a challenge in business. And I think it's probably the challenge of most people is because they, they really aren't walking the same path as their ideal customer, but they haven't done the work to understand their ideal customer's real essence yet. And I really like that idea of, um, it's not the customer's job to understand you, it's your job to uh, position yourself in such a way and have that lingo set up where customers understand and are attracted to you as well. That's a really great um, insight, that, a big takeaway from this episode. So um, uh, definitely like remember that because it helps a lot when you're trying to create the lingo that inspires you to invest that extra time towards crafting like uh, your brand, crafting how customers are going to see your brand and the language you use to communicate with them. And we've been talking about lingo throughout this episode. Um, so that's one of the books we mentioned. I also mentioned Brick by Brick, but uh, in addition to those books, Jeffrey, I'm wondering if you could share with us three great books that you believe will have a positive impact on us. Oh my gosh, three books, huh? Who I read like two books a week, so I'm such an avid reader. I'm always on to the, <laughs> the next book. So um, one book that I absolutely love uh, by Ian Shamandi, and the book is called Why Should I Choose You? Absolutely love this book. Uh, it's probably the only book I've ever read where I thought, damn, I wish I'd written this. Um, because to me, that is the ultimate question. It sort of it ties in perfectly what we're just saying. Like, if you can't if you can't make it clear to your customer why they should choose you, then then you're in trouble. <laughs> right. So uh, I love the idea that why should I choose you? Uh, certainly another classic and, and favorite book of mine is Fascinate by Sally Hogshead. Uh especially the revised version. Uh, the original version was more a little more about personal fasc fascination. The revised version released a couple of years ago uh, is about brand fascination. And what I love about the work of Sally Hogshead is that she's got it. She's got the brand messaging idea down right uh, in that it is, you know, when you're building a business, it's less about what you think of what you do. What really matters is how does the world see what you do? 
which is the World Fund Fast. Because you can think of the greatest widget or you know app in the world, but if the world doesn't see the value in it, it won't sell. Right? And I, I have friends actually have developed 99 cent apps, spent thousands and thousands of dollars to develop an app for, and selling it for 99 cents and it didn't sell. It's like, well, it's because you thought it was going to be great, but the world doesn't think it is. Right? So I love the whole concept of how the world sees you. Gosh, that's two. Um, let me see a third. So many good ones. All right. So the, the third would be one of my favorite books uh, of all time, actually, by Todd Henry, who's also one of my favorite authors. And the book is called Louder Than Words. You'll see a theme here, right? I am, you know, I did write a book called Lingo. <laughs> um, but what I love about Louder Than Words is what it's really saying, if I were to summarize the book, is what is louder than words is the energy behind the words. And if you really take that in, you'll understand more openly what I'm talking about with lingo, right? It's how people are interpreting what you're saying is more is is bigger and more important than even the words themselves, especially when you're aligned to the right person. So I, I think Todd Henry in writing louder than words was was spot on. I actually emailed him halfway through the book and said, this might be one of the most important books of our time because of the way book business has shifted. Uh, people are making decisions today on who to do business with and what brands to do business with based on a feeling of energy and how they feel about that business, whether they feel their values are aligned more than ever before. And we see the opposite, right? How, how many businesses are encountering huge problems right now because some some level of transparency comes around and masses of people don't agree with the values of that company and they stop doing business with them, right? So the energy of the words is actually even more important than the words themselves. So those are, those are the three books I would recommend. Jeffrey, thank you for sharing those great book recommendations. Those will be in the show notes, markdeverty.com slash E228. If you guys want a free book that will help you create, promote, and optimize your content for growth and revenue, you can grab your copy of Content Marketing Secrets. Just pay for the shipping at marketbirdie.com slash book. And before we wrap up this episode, Jeffrey, I've asked you several questions throughout our time together, but what do you believe is one question that we need to be asking ourselves more often? One question. Uh, you know, it sounds so cliche with all we've talked about, but... If, if everybody can walk away with this one thing, I think it'll be important is who am I meant to serve, right? And I'm saying that a little differently than, you know, who's your ideal customer. Uh, in, in Lingo, the chapter about how to define your ideal customer is chapter two. And the title of that chapter is who will love that, All right? So actually, let's make that the, the most important question people are going to ask right now. Who will love that? So that you're building a business for people that already value who you are and what you do, and you're not spending the rest of your business years chasing people and trying to convince them of anything. Build a business, speak in the lingo of your ideal customers, and, and you do that by understanding, well, you know who you are, what you have to offer, who will love that? Most important question I think you can ask. Jeffrey, thank you for sharing with us that great question and all of your great insights throughout our time together. Uh, don't forget, Breakthrough Success listeners, to get Jeffrey's book, Lingo, where you will be able to discover your ideal customer's secret language and make your business irresistible. That book, again, will be in the show notes. But Jeffrey, I can't thank you enough for sharing all of your great insights with us today. It was such a pleasure to have you once well, again on Breakthrough <laughs> Success. Exactly. It's great to be back, Mark. I, congratulations on all your success, uh, putting out uh, 228 episodes. Uh, that's just awesome. It's been two years for you. So uh, proud to have known you and, and witnessed your journey. So thank you for having me back. Thank you, Jeffrey. It was a pleasure to have you back. How does over 100 retweets per day sound to you? My free ebook, 27 Ways to Get More Retweets on Twitter, has you covered. I use the methods within this ebook to get over 10,000 retweets every single quarter to learn.